hopefully one or two real ones as well. There's a fair bit of weed on the bottom because of that. Right, as you can see, we've got brilliant sunshine at the moment, but I'm not too sure how long it's going to last, as we've got plenty of clouds about too. Now, I've tackled up, and I thought I'd better start explaining some of my tackle and setups to you. Uh, the cider rig first, I've got a 13 foot rod made up here, and it's normal carbon fibre construction. It's quite a new model, and it's got a very, very forgiving tip that I can pull right round on, with no danger at all of pulling out of a fish, I hope, or my tackle breaking. And it's fully lined rings all the way up, fairly standard practice now, Fuji type rings, and normal cork handle, good grip on the end, and the reel I'm using is one of the finger dab type. Now this works, instead of having to manually open the bail arm, you just push down, release, the bail arm opens on its own. This one, in particular, is unique. It's the first of its kind. You can actually open the bail arm and close it manually. On the predecessors of, of this type of reel, you've always had to clonk the handle on. And that was a good way of losing fish. It tend to, tended to snatch the line off your finger and maybe bump the fish off the hook. And that doesn't happen with this type of reel. I've got in the habit, in fact, of closing it manually every time because it does stop the line especially in windy conditions like we've got today when it's a little bit in your face, it does stop the line going over the, the roller, which can cause a break as you wind on. And what I'd like to do now is to show you the slider knot that I use. It's extremely simple. There's an awful lot of mystery being spoken and written about slider knots, but this one anybody can do, and it takes a few seconds to learn. I'm just going to break off. This is four pound line. It's, it's off a the feeder reel spool. As you can see, it's I've got a white spool clip on it before, so I know it's four pound line. So it's carrying a big hundred metre spool of four pound. I don't think I'd use hundred metre in slider knots in hundred years. We'll break off a bit, and I'll show you the knot. Just take the reel line. We can tie this knot anywhere because we can slide it to the depth we want, and we'll make that into a loop. It's an ordinary loop like that, and we'll lay it along the real line. So we've got the knot there, two ends sticking up, and the real line going along the body of the line, if you like. Then holding those all those together, we'll just put one end of the, the line we're using for our slide, not the four pound line, through that loop that incorporates the real line and the slider knot line. We'll put that through about five times. And then like you should do with all knots when you're knotting nylon monofilament, it should be wet. And as my mouth's nearer than the water, I'm gonna lick it. Then we can just pull that up, gently. It doesn't have to be particularly tight at the moment because we're going to get the depth organized first. And that's set, the knot's big enough that will never pass through the eye of that little, the hole in that little swivel. We've got two great long ends, about three inches long. Now another problem people have with slider knots, they tend to cut them much too short. And nylon being the character, characteristics, having the characteristics that it's got, the shorter you make it, the stiffer it gets. Like you get bristles in nylon brooms. If you cut those bristles shorter, they're much stiffer. The longer you make them, they can even turn into paintbrushes. So what we want to do is leave our ends quite long. And if they're probably inch and a half, you'll find they won't be so stiff and they'll pass right through the rings of our rod. Sometimes we may be fishing 20 plus feet of water and we'll have the knot even on the reel. And in that situation, what you don't want is a knot that's gonna catch on your rings. So your float won't follow through properly, you'll be casting all over the place. So we'll leave our ends at least an inch and a half long. We'll just trim those off. I don't like scissors, I use my teeth because Oh, my teeth as well. Couldn't get a set made to do that. It leaves you two little flat spots on the end of each piece of nylon. And if you're doing an important knot, like a loop or a blood knot, 
that's not going to slip back through because you've got a little exaggerated flat on the end that's going to hold against the tightness of the knot. If you get a really lovely smooth round end to the knot, there's nothing there should you not really have done a proper knot to stop it sliding through. Some people burn it with cigarette, cigarette ends but I'd rather not smoke anyway. Now, that knot is on the line in position, we can slide it as we want to, it doesn't crease or kink the line and it's an extremely simple knot to do. This is another 13 foot rod, in fact it's absolutely brand new and you might not even find these in the shops yet, it's, I'm almost field testing it. It's very very slim, made out of carbon fibre again but this time using silicon carbide whiskers incorporated um, in the resin that used to bind the carbon and a very attractive, I think, braiding around the blank and that stops the blank twisting when it's under extreme pressure and these rods, this type of material has been out now for a couple of years but this is now on a new rod with probably a slightly softer top than they've had before it bends very easily indeed and for the closer in sort of work that I'll be doing I'm using quite light line, quite light hook links, and I think that type of top action is absolutely essential for that kind of fishing. Reel's the same as you've seen before. Very different handle on this rod. Instead of the conventional cork, it's got this simulated rubber material. It's made flat along there to stop any roundness rolling off your arm when you're fishing. That sits snugly under your arm when you're fishing and gives you a perfectly sound, stable base for the butt end of your rod. It's also got these two detachable bits on the end, which I'll be leaving on today, but in other situations where I was fishing a stick float and the rod was moving around a bit in front of my body, then they'd be off and in my pocket. Right, now I'll tell you about the hooks I'm using today. On my waggler rig, for the fairly close in fishing, I'm using a size 18, Camasan barbless hook. They're chemically sharpened, extremely sharp. In fact, they go in and out your finger without you knowing. And they don't damage the bait either. You can get really perfect presentation of maggots on those. They don't make big holes and, and let the maggot bust everywhere. And I've tied that to a pound and a half breaking strain Diver High Tech Hook Monofill, which is a very soft, limp line that's quite buoyant. So it does tend to behave very light under the water. Fish have a habit of blowing onto the bottom when they want to feed and they tend to take the samples of feed as they rise up off the bottom. And if you're using stiff old heavy nylon, then the bait won't react in a natural way. And it's got to behave really like the samples that are laying around it. And the slight buoyancy of the line counteracts the weight of the hook to a certain extent. On my slider rod, because I'm fishing for bigger fish, hopefully, at Bream, there's some very big hybrids in this part of the world, sometimes to over two pounds. Then on that I'm using two pound hook length material and the hook's a size 18 again, but a Camasan forged hook with a very, very small barb. So again, we don't damage the bait too much, but if I'm using something like a worm, the worm won't be able to wriggle off. The knot I'm using is a double loop and all my hook links are exactly the same length. I tie them before I go fishing and I, I keep them on special little hook retaining systems. And I tie a loop on the end of my reel line, there's a loop on the end of my hook link, join the two loops together and away you go. Should I hook the bottom and have to break off and lose my hook or should I, the hook get blunt or damaged in any way, I can change that hook link with confidence knowing it's exactly the same length as its predecessor. And there's never a shot on my hook links. The first shot goes directly above the top of the top loop. So I don't have to worry about the shotting of the float being any different at all or anything like that. Now on this rig, you'll notice there's no shot at all. That's because I've not plumbed the depth yet. And I plumb the depth in a slightly different way from most people. I'll show you now. Let's find a plummet. Again, non-toxic and for ease, I like to use these great big crocodile mother-in-law plummets, some people call them, because they keep going like that. Now, 
Fetch some line out. Come, it just snaps. Shut onto the hook like that. We'll have a stab at the depth and say it's going to be about six foot. Get our float to roughly six foot. There's no locking shot on the line at all. And this float is now going to have no visible means of support. I'm going to make a simple loop between two fingers, turn it round and put it over the top of the float. It's absolutely dead simple, but I'll show you again. Just take the line, loop it round your fingers and put it over the top of the float. And if you pull it tight, that float stays in position. Now if I'd shotted this float with, it takes about three treble A, if I'd shotted this float with a three treble A and then put a plummet on the hook, I'm casting two weights. Now if you've ever tried casting two weights in the same direction, six or seven feet apart at the same time, which undoubtedly have, because that's how most people plumb the deck, you'll know what a problem it is and you can very rarely get the float where you want it. Now like this, that float weighs as near to nothing as you can get and that's going to follow my plummet out exactly where I want it. I'm going to stand up to do it because it's a little bit easier to have some control. Without disappearing into part of the locker, just flex the rod, open the bail arm, trap the line on your finger and just drop into position. Now you're going to think I've done that before, haven't you? But I've not, that was a guess and that's absolutely cock on the depth. And we can see there, assuming I'm six foot, that's about seven foot to the top of my float. I'm going to want to be six inches, probably over depth. So all I do, pull the loop off the top of the float, pull that up six inches, don't let go of it, reach down, take any size of shot, doesn't make any difference at all because it's just going to be the top stopper, back to my finger, pinch that on the line, and now I'm ready to shot up. Now, ground baits. There's two main ground baits there, and that's an additive, and I'll probably put a bit of that in. It's called Brassum, which is Belgian and German, I think, for bream and it's got a lovely coconutty, caramelly sort of smell. And once you've opened a bag, it's the most beautiful air purifier for your car. This is Super Cup, very, very popular ground bait, based mainly on maize and coconut husk, I think. There's quite a fair bit of coconut in it, and that's a good active ground bait. It tends to bubble and fizz a lot. Very good for bream, especially smaller skimmer bream. And big ones like it as well. And this is beet, which is purely Belgian for bait. And it's a very good all round still water ground bait. It's got all sorts of goodies in it. There's maize again, there's coconut again, all sorts of things, binders. And that will tend to hold this together, the super cup, which is a slightly coarser. The beet will bind the super cup and together they should work and fizz away on the bottom so we can catch some fish on the slider. Now, I'm going to put in that some red dye because I've found over the years, especially in this part of the world, but on most still waters, red's a good colour. And for almost every species of animal, red is an attractive thing to eat. If you look at all your McDonald's, Wimpy's, Burger Kings, they're all red. They're not very nice to eat, they're still red. And there's a couple of liquid additives I use from time to time, roach and bream attractor. I won't be using the roach attractor today in ground bait, but I'll put a speck or two in the maggots, but I'll pop a bit of bream attractor, hopefully with the brasm, the two might work well together. These, lots of people ask me do they work, and it's very difficult to quantify whether they work or not. Uh, all I know is that I smell of me, fish or wild animals, and all wild animals don't like people. So if I can mask the people smell by putting a drop of this on my maggots, or even 
what I'll do sometimes is just tip that onto my hand, not a lot, just a speck, and instead of smelling to me, I smell like a bowl of fruit salad. Now, get some water. There's a fair bit to go around, so take some water. Using the collapsible mixing bowl, generally collapses halfway through your mix. Discard a couple of maggots, thought they were going on their holidays. We'll put some water in. Just a little bit first of all, because all we want to do is get our ground bait blended together. And first of all, to make sure it's going to be an even mix, we'll put the red dye in the water. We'll bite that top off and all. There. Squeeze a few drops of that in. It's extremely potent stuff. There's not more than about 20 or 30 drops in there. The bottle's hardly gone down at all. Looks like I've cut my finger off. And that is very, very bright. Almost blood red. And that should be enough colour in there. Just get a tinge onto my ground baits. Open the tops up. Said I've had some crisps in my time, the way I open those packets. Bit of super cut. About 50-50, it's not particularly important, the exact quantities, as long as it's knocked up right. Get that about a bit. And I'm not going to open this up completely because I'm only going to use a very small amount of this. It's extremely potent and you don't want half and half of this. You just put a bit in and that is an absolutely wonderful smell. Bit of a mix about. It's gone much darker brown than it would be normally because of the red dye, but because the dye is water soluble, as it goes in, little red clouds will come off it and things will start happening quite nicely. I'm going to shove a good handful of casters in that and a few pinkies and then get some out into the middle of the lake, maybe not that far, get some out a good way into the lake and maybe pull a few bream over it. Now, it's time to do some fishing. And what I intend to do first of all, I'm going to put my slider out where I've plumbed the depth. Found it to be 11 or 12 foot. A lot of people wouldn't use a slider in those sort of depths, but I've found, especially in still water, once you get over eight feet, a slider works that much more efficiently. So I've set one up today. I'm just going to put two maggots on. They seem to catch about anything that swims. And with any luck on this slider rig, you'll catch a bream or two. And I'm going to cast, you'll notice when I cast, that it's as near as possible a straight movement like that. If you start your rod off straight, the chances are everything in front of it will go straight. So let's just pop it out into the water and get a little bit of feeding. Now, I'm going to sink the line, just put the rod under, sharply lift it. That's got it all under. And you'll also notice I don't use a rod rest. I don't see why you need one when you've got your bum. Now, a couple of small bowls of ground bait because I don't think we've had such terrible weather just lately. I don't think we're going to get that many fish. So, we'll just put two small balls out and see what happens. Now, as you saw when I plumbed, we're about seven foot deep. I'm fishing seven foot deep, which is eight or nine inches over depth. I'm doing that to keep the float still, 
so it won't get dragged about by the tow or the wind too much. And any fish mooching along, they're not going to be swimming about ravenous. They might be up in the water because it's turned into such a pleasant day that the water temperature is going to be rising and that can encourage fish to come up to the surface. There's also an enormous hatch of flies everywhere you look. As soon as the wind dies, there's flies everywhere, all over the lake. And there's even been the odd fish pimping, taking them just off the surface. Now, if they are going to come up in the, in the water, I'm going to be ready for them. Oh, there we go. It weren't much of a bite. The float just moved along a bit, like it does sometimes when you get this sort of... And I'll tell you what, it's not a roach either. Like you get in these sort of flow conditions. It's not having a right go, but it's definitely bigger than a roach. And it's not thumping its head like a bream either. Might get the needle in a minute, now it's coming close. Strange things, fish, whichever way you pull, they'll pull the opposite way. So if you want to come down, want them to come up, you pull up, and like this one's doing, they go down. It's, oh, it's an ivory, oops, and reverse off. It might be a brain. Go on, my son. Come to daddy. Come to daddy. I don't mind doing this all day, aren't I? All that about waiting for a bite can be part of the fun, and as much fun as this. The lion's having a little sing now, I'm going to get it. I'll tell you what, they see these rocks and they don't want to come home at all. Can't go too mad, because I said I'm fishing a more conventional English tackle. If I was fishing at home, and had a fish like this in a match, the old pump would be going 19 to the dozen. The old Werbenick needs beat the blockers to play snooker. Imagine what he'd need if he did this. Oh. I'll tell you what, they never know when they're... Look, you know you're coming in, you might as well give up now. I'll tell you what, it makes you go all dry in the mouth, this. Oh, oh. I don't know where they get it from. Must be something in these maggots. Come on. That's... Yes, yes. Oh, oh. Look at that swirl. Oh, it's high, but it is a good hybrid, isn't it? Come on. Please. Come on. Come on. Come to daddy. Got it. <laughs> Look at that. That's a nice fish. That is a lovely fish. Don't get too many of these hybrids at home. When you do, they tend to go up to about six or eight ounces. And then that's the end of it. But that is absolutely beautiful. Look at that. A bit later on in the year, they'll get a bit yellow underneath here, and they get all buttery coloured. They don't fight any harder, though. Thank the Lord. Right. I don't know if I want his mums and dads, but let's see if he's got any brothers and sisters out there. A couple more maggots. If I catch another one, I'll either get on a caster or two, maybe even a worm and a caster. Overhead cast again. Sink the line. Ended in the same part of the world. A few more casters this time because that one's obvious yet a few. And I was a fair time playing it, so I've had a few minutes without feeding. If I'm trying to pull them up in the water, which would be nice. Bit of ground bait for the slider. Although that one's come quicker than I expected. Good hope. Oh, 
They're there already. Oh, this is definitely a brain. It's just thumped its head, and when a brain thumps its head, there's nothing that thumps its head like a brain. I don't know how big it is, it could be anything from a pound to four. But it's had a good thump. And it's just had a little rattle. They tend to roll over the line and all. Sometimes they come in, look like they're foul looks and everybody thinks you're something other than unlucky. But usually, they've just rolled over. The line goes round their petrol fins. It's in a pound, it's bigger than a pound. The line goes around their petrol fins and they stop fighting. Mind you, it's better when they do that on matches than now. I tell you what, you can't do much better in this than you. I've got a good fish on. I'm having a lovely day. There's swallows scudding about all over the water, eating the flies that are hatching. It's going for a few rocks down there, isn't it? I don't really want it to get near it. It might snag up. Oh, that's good, that orange stuff. It's come off while I'm playing this fish. I'll either need thinner tubing or a fatter float. There's some fatal attraction around that corner. I don't know what it is. Something there they like. See if I can stop them going that way. They tend to pull in the opposite way. To the way you pull. Yeah, that's got it in front of me now. Just having a little fun. It's a good job they don't fight like these on the big English rivers when they're flowing, because you'd never land one. Well, you don't get many bream here bigger than a kilo, about two and a quarter pound. But this one is fighting much bigger than that. I can't remember the last time I had a bream that took line. <laughs> come on. It don't want to come in, this. Come on, it's nice out here. Look, the sun's out and everything. Oh, look at that swell. It looks like a dinner table. Oh, that is a nice brain. And I'll tell you what, you can tell the water's... Ah! Damn, it's come off. Never mind. If that one's out there, there's plenty more. Let's get out there as quick as I can and catch another one. This is the time when all the small worms disappear. There we are. There's one. Get that one. The lighter coloured cast one. Should be able to see the black now, that ripples up again. There we go. Nine under. Bit of ground bait. That's fed every one of the six counties. Let's put another ball out. Them few pinkies, I think, just breaking it up a bit. He said with a funny look on his face. Good. Right. Now I mean it, now I've got the needle. I'm going to lay in the next one. Well, I'm not best pleased at losing that fish because it was a good one. As it swirled, I reckon that was probably three pounds, maybe three and a bit, and that's a big fish for this part of the world. Still. That one's here, there's going to be some more. I'm just going to pop a few casters on my loose feed line. Because if I've messed it up, well, I've lost it down in the side. I don't think it'll affect the shoal to any great extent because they're going to be there. Oh, they're there. Yep, this is another bream. It's just that big thump. It's like in a suitcase, first of all. 
one or two characteristic bangs of its head. This will not take so long. Oh, there I go. Oh, that If I lose this one, I won't tell you what I'll do. Because you won't be seeing it. Because there'll be lots of rather short words associated with it. Come on, come on. There he is. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Lockern, Bream, numero uno. Ah, oh, this is in. Looks like it's been undergoing its conjugals. It's got all little white bony bumps on its head. They call them spawning tubercles. And that is what the little beast has been doing. Right in the lip. Here we go, he's a nice fish. It's, it's been caught before and all. I shouldn't think there's many people come here, but that one's... I don't know, it might be a... There's been a one or two cormorants about. It might be a cormorant that's had a go at it. Let's get this kit out of the way. Now, these pegs, this section of river, has produced at least two winners of the famous Benson and Hedges competition. The first one was won by Harold Patterson, who's a resident of Northern Ireland, and the second one was won by Ian Heaps. And on that match, he actually broke the world match record as it was then, with 166 pound of roach. The character of the river's changed a little bit since then, the roach used to form huge migratory shoals that went in and out of the river from Lockern to Spong. But here, some have taken up residence, but it's mainly bream now. This stretch of river is famous for its bream. It's still early spring. There's a couple of foot on the river. Normally, I'll be sitting down in the water just an inch or so deep. There's probably 18 inches or two feet there now, so I'm not going to be getting in there. It's also cold. There's plenty of pace. It's really ideal conditions at the moment. We've got a nice upstream wind, although that's been changing as I've been sitting, really. It, it, it can come and go. It comes in your face one minute and upstream the next. But now it's just about dead right. A little bit pacey. The average angler would probably swim feeder it. But today, I'm going to have a look at something that you don't see too often. Two different setups, in fact. I've got a selection of floats here. Um, wagglers and some top and bottom floats as well um, that I'll break down into separate categories for you. These are floats that we'd normally fish fixed top and bottom. We've got a big stick float there. That takes eight number four. Very heavy float. It's got weight built into the base, which is cane. And that'll carry some shot. And we'd be able to cast three or four rod lengths with that and get out to where the fish are. The problem is that it's that deep that this float probably wouldn't function quite properly. This is another top and bottom float, although it's shaped more like a waggler. But careful inspection, it's got a ring there and a ring there. And in fact, it's a two ring slider. Now you don't see too many of those used. Uh, there's one or two places where you can use nothing else. They've got to be used where you get awkward swims with trees, bushes around you, and it's deep. Thankfully, we've not got that today, so we won't be using the double ring slider. But one float I will be using is that, and that's known as a topper, after Topper Haskins, the Bristol lad, who fishes these on the Bristol Avon virtually everywhere he goes. Around Reading, they call them Mickey Mouse floats. Can't understand why. This river today is just like the Bristol Avon with a drop on, and that's when Topper scores, so we could well have a fish or two on that one. 
Well, while I've been tackling up, we've had the sun in and out, we've had some rain, and you'll probably notice I've been re-pegged. There's a junior match here tomorrow, and they've started with peg 20, 25 as 26, and peg 24 has now become peg 25. I hope that don't mean I don't catch quite so many, because I think 24 is the best peg. And let's show you the tackle I've set up. First, the waggler rod. It's a 13 foot Normark Avenger. Lovely, powerful rod, ideal for a big waggler. Cork handle, Fuji rings. I'm using a Daiwa Altercast reel with the finger dab by alarm. That opens automatically, and you can also close it manually. It's been one problem with the finger dab reels in the past. You've not been able to use the manual closing facility. You've always had to wind on with the handle, and that causes a terrific thump that can make a hook bump out of a fish and cost you a fish unnecessarily. On that I've got two and a half pound Maxima line because with the waggler, if the wind goes downstream and it's blown every way but upwards today, if the wind goes downstream, I'll be able to sink the line and get better presentation on the float. Now, going up from the hook, and the hook is a size 16 forged camasan, chemically sharpened, small barb which I've just nipped in just a little bit because we only really want the barb should we go on to a worm and it'll hold the worm on nicely. That's tied to two pound breaking strain hook link, about 18 inches long, standard length. I make all my hook links the same length so should I have to change I know I'm going to be fishing exactly the same depth and I won't be altering my presentation in any way. I've got one number four shot on the top of the hook link, never put a shot on the hook link either bit weaker than the main line and there I've got four number four shot together they're just slightly apart because it does stop the line twisting if you put them touching you tend to stretch the line as you put them on and as the line contracts the shot will tend to curl a little bit and that can make your bait spin a bit like helicopter and you wind up in all sorts of trouble with twisted hook links and all general nastiness they're the lead free shot obviously although we don't have to use them in Ireland uh, I've converted now completely to lead free shot, don't use anything else. And this new double cut shot I've found to be as good, if not better, than lead. It's certainly easy to move up and down the line. And with four number four shot, I've got plenty of scope for doing that. Should I want to put another shot down with my dropper, I can do so. Or should I want to spread the shot maybe up the line, or even alter the shape of the bulk slightly, if the wind should come into my face, Lord knows what it's going to do next. or the topper. For this I'm using a Daiwa Whisker Kevlar tournament match. It's got a new, completely new type of handle. It's actually, the reel, if you could see underneath there, is more or less against the blank of the rod. It's a very lightweight graphite combination handle and the, this bit actually screws down onto the, onto the reel seat itself, ensuring you get no wobbling the reel, that's as steady as a rock, you couldn't get a reel firmer on the line than that. That's loaded with two and a half pound line, it's a floating line this time, it's a diver one, it doesn't really matter as long as you get a good floating line. I've found this one to float because with the top of float, we're fishing it top and bottom, we'll want to get the line round behind the float just to hold it back and control it slightly through the swim. Hook again, 16, forged camera sand, barb trim slightly, 18 inch hook link, two pound breaking strain. On the end of the hook link, there's two number sixes. They're at fingernail distance apart. On the knot, just off the knot, the two loops that join the hook link to the main line, I can move one up if I want to, or I can have them both together. And that's how I'm going to start. With this amount of flow, we should be able to get the two number sixes dragging along quite nicely showing our, slowing our float down under the water. Now the important bit is the bulk shot and with the topper you get a fair portion of it. I always use BB shot nothing bigger down the line with the topper. If you use treble A's or swans they tend to cause the horrible line twist which we've spoken about before and we don't really want that. These are the double cut shot again. I've tried to line them all up, quite difficult with eight, two or three is a piece of cake, but with eight it's quite difficult to get all the slots together because that'll stop them 
finning around and, and, and maybe causing a bit of twist, which we don't want. Nice little gap between each one, up to the float, and that's just on the line with three float bands. It's quite important to use three float bands with the topper because this being fairly delicate crow quill, it's a bulky shot. If you strike and that suddenly should reduce the distance there, the float will collapse in the middle and break. So I've put a long piece of silicon tubing there, smaller piece on the bottom of the float and a nice long piece on the top as well. Another little trick with this, if one of these should break, I've got enough on the others, I can just carefully split them apart and I've got an extra float rubber. Now for my bait apron. It's not going to be used to carry bait today, but it's made out of cloth. It's been used a time or two before, and it's handy when you're using ground bait to have something to wipe your hands on and to hopefully protect you from a bit of nasty slime should we catch some nasty slimy bream. There you are. Ground bait on there. Maggots. Put your lid under your bait box, you'll never lose them. Worms. Ready to go. And last of all, the casters with a catapult already in. I'll probably be loose feeding a few from time to time. Just keep the fish interested. Okay, let's get fishing. Before we start to fish proper, I'm just going to plumb the depth, make absolutely sure of myself. I've been out and had a quick look at it with a plummet, found the ledge, but now we want to get it shotted up, get it depthed up absolutely correct. Bit of ground, but I'm going to feed very regularly until we start catching some fish. And then you've got to let the fish guide you. You can try upping it a bit, but if you're catching steady, just keep it going and you can fiddle about with hook bait. Sometimes you'll catch three or four, especially bream, you'll catch three or four on double maggot and suddenly you can't get a bite. Change to a maggot and a caster or a worm and a caster or a double caster. Down the hole, you're in again. Hold that back. You can do the same, same thing with the waggler as you do with the topper. When you get as far as you want to go, close the bail arm and hold it. It'll sink out of sight and watch the end of your rod. Sometimes you'll get, I won't, but sometimes you get, and there's a fish. Told you I wouldn't. It's in. But it don't take long for it to start tipping down the rain here. There's clouds going across all the time. Let's get out again. Sink the line. A few casters. It's a waste of time getting kitted up because it don't ever last more than five minutes. Cover my maggots up. Now, as the float goes down the swim, you'll notice I just either let the line off with my fingers like that. Generally with the waggler I'll do it like this with the rod down because I'm actually trying to slow the float down by a controlled amount. If I slow it down by too much, it'll disappear out of sight and I won't know. That's a bite. I didn't think we'd have to wait too long before we caught one. I'll tell you what, it's a bream and all. They've come on that ground bait absolutely suck on. I've got to be a bit careful because there's some dead reeds under the surface and they've got a tendency to get into it. They're only just down there and in the summer they're up and of course we'd be standing out just past them. But at this time of the year they're under the water and they're difficult to see and these bream on the urn fight like I don't know what. If I was fishing one of the big competitions using the, the more conventional feeder, I'd obviously be using stouter tackle and a bit stronger rod, and I'd be able to pull. But this rod, I'll handle it beautifully on this balanced tackle that I'm using now. I've got no worries about the line breaking, but the hook might pull out. Sometimes they transfer into the, 
It's going right where those reeds, they know exactly where they are. They transfer the hook into the reeds, they're sort of swimming with their mouth open, grab hold of a reed and shake their head. I'll tell you what, I don't know who's going to wind up wetter here, me or the bream. Never mind, it's worth it when there's catching. That's right in those stick-ups now, look at that little devil. It knows exactly, exactly where it's going. And I know exactly where I want it to go, and that's in there. Come on. I love you, really. They usually average about a kilo a piece, these bring, two and a quarter pound. But this time of the year, with this extra flow, they fight like billio. Back home, especially in a lake, you'd have this on the bank in a few seconds. Now it's pouring a rain. Ah, the sun's out and so's the hook. Never mind. Well, there's one, there's a million more. Maggots just doubled over the hook, just gives you a bad hook hold. Never mind. I'm quite confident I'll catch some more. Oh dear. Slow it down slightly. That's where I'm expecting to get bites, in that little area there. It's just slow it down. See the float? Just lifting and rising as the bait bounces over. That's it, that's another one. Don't want to come, here it comes. Just got to get their head facing towards you, and once they're coming in, they'll come all the way. And if you let them turn their head round the other way, they'll go the other way, and then you're in big trub. Keep them going the same way. I'm just worried about those reed stems like I've been all day. There'll be a big thump in a minute. There it is. Come on, don't turn your head. The longer we can keep its head facing the same way, the quicker we'll land it. Look out the stems, out the stems. Come on, out those stems. The bit they don't like is coming out. They see the light and they have another little go. Come on, out them stems. Oh, you beast. Look at that. Wouldn't surprise me. Crocodile Dundee of the Pipe World lives down there. And he's having a little pop. There's a reed stem just popped up there as this fish has gone through them. There's a swirl. Ooh. I always get frightened there's going to be a pike underneath them because when they come up, it did half make you jump. Because pike that can take two and a half pound bream, a big pike. I don't even mind the rain. There he is. Ah, 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 ah. Come on. I think this might be an hybrid. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, hybrid, no wonder. They always have a pop in the side. Oh, and that changed to the way it's done the trick. Oh, solid fish. Look at that. Yeah. All the characteristics of bream and roach. And the fight is roach plus bream plus a bit of chub. In you go. Right, it's persisting down quite nicely now. If we get another damp spell. That's it, absolutely spot on. Sometimes the line gets caught around these rings a wee bit. Running it through. This wind's just doing you so many favours, it's unbelievable. That's a fish. It's another bream. Just kiting in the flow. I use this extra pull of water. It's got to keep him out of them sticks. It's amazing, once you've had a few, get a bit more confident. Always come in quicker than the first one. That's 
says. In you go. Typical locker and brain. It's slightly smaller than normal, probably just under a kilo. Pound and three quarters, something like that. Let's get him in the net. Oh, these little barb ducks, I prefer to get them out with a disgorger. Just a little, push his little barb out easier. That's it. Now let's. Back in again now. Pop him in. Go and get another one. Three maggots seems to have worked that time. See if it'll work this time. Sun's coming out again. Going from winter to spring to summer. All in five minutes. There we go. That's another one. They're there now. This topper. When you can get fish on it, it's absolutely unbeatable. This wind's just holding it up, it's sitting up and begging at them almost, the bait. And they're just taking it as it goes past. Not a care in the world, the bream. Kite round in the flow. And I'm quite a long way down the peg and it's a help really. Because when you get them close in, they tend to bore straight down. When you get them out a little way, and right down your peg, they kite out in the current, you can get your rod low, bring them up off the bottom. As soon as you get your rod high, see they start doing a big one. Gotta watch those pipe breeds. There he is. Now, come to daddy. That's it. And there you go. We're building up a nice net of fish now. I think at the end of the day, we're going to have some real good bag. We're going to have a real good bag of fish here. Look out. In we go. And away we go. Scorge your back. Keep that a bit closer. That's it. There. Right. Three maggots. Suckers for maggots, these bream. Back home in England, you get a lot more on caster or worm and caster. But when they really start coming, you'll get them on the maggot and there's nothing to beat it. You can use pinkies. I've had some really good catches of bream on pinky. Tend to be smaller fish. But on some of the drains, pinkies used in conjunction with squats. This wind now, coming a bit more at us than I'd like, although it's working. Float's working perfectly. I'm going to watch it very closely, and if it does start going wrong, then I shall be out on the waggle again. It's holding back a dream at the moment. I just don't want it to hold back too much. That can stop your catching. When the bait goes chasing past the fish, they'll sometimes have a snatch at it. Give them too much to look at. And I might realise there's a nice bit of Japanese steel in there looking at them. Some loose casters. Get the line right up in the air. I can almost stop that float sometimes. Right back, right back. 
It's lovely. Oh, my son. Where are you? You know you can't hide for long. You can almost force it on them like this. Go oh, and get hold of it. No, it's just a little, little bit of a snag there. I've noticed it a few times as I've been running through. Wind's gone. Wind goes, line goes around the top of the rod. Brain don't compensate for it in time. That's it. Bit of ground bait. Spot on. Absolutely spot on. You think I'll practice this, wouldn't you? That's it, I deserve that one. That's it, another one. God, dear, oh dear. The thump they give you on the strike. I've got this right down the end of my peg, right the way down. It's coming up, it's kiting it right into the side. It's coming in nicely now, though. Come on, it's going right into those reeds. I know Rome is all right. Come on out of there. Get an awkward one when you're really catching like this. And sometimes, oops, there it is. And sometimes they just get a wee bit excited. It's all the sticks. It's a shame you can't see them because these bream are so clever. It's like just like the chub do back in England. Got rain and sun at the same time. Again, lovely combination. Very regular here. There he is, another two pound. Ooh. Stay still, stay still. Ah, be a good boy. Now it's just got white tubercles on its head. They get them around this time of the year when they're spawning. It's, I don't know what, they, what it actually means, I don't know what they're for, but they just appear all around the top of their head and just on their gill rakers. Very nice to smashing. 